Tales from the Gas Station, Parts 1 and 2. At the edge of our town, there's this crappy little gas station that's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you were to go inside, you would see row after row of off-brand chips, cookies, potted meals, and ramen. Expiration dates suspiciously missing from canned goods, like they were filed off years ago in some misguided attempt to control inventory turnover. A faded, wet floor sign from way back covering a crack in the foundation by the cooler that has since turned into a pothole. The pothole, a collection point for sticky spill-off that has become a miniature tar pit collecting countless insect corpses and the occasional small rodent. Nobody ever complains about the aesthetic. By some providence bordering on the supernatural, the health inspector has repeatedly signed off on the business, always kindly ignoring both the faint smell of some kind of mysterious chemical cocktail that is the defining characteristic of the establishment, and the family of mutated raccoons that live in the crawl space behind the grease trap. Well, we think they're mutated anyway. At the very least, they must be inbred to the point of loss of higher cognitive function. The Alpha, a muscular three-foot-tall son of a gun named Rocco, has been spotted multiple times chewing on people's tires and has been run over at least twice, but he just keeps coming back. That lingering smell, a sweet combination of honeysuckle, ammonia, vomit, and who knows what else, has never been positively identified. But the prevalent theory is that it's coming from the cracks in the foundation, wafting up from underground. It's strongest right after a rain, and pungent to the point of tear-inducing if you get too close to the storm drains where even Rocco and his clan refuse to tread. If you were to go inside, you might also see the bathroom cowboy. He exists as a sort of urban legend. Even though he's never been officially confirmed to exist, we have several security camera recordings of a man fitting his description entering the building, heading into the bathroom, and leaving. What makes him legendary are the things people claim to see him doing in the bathroom. The stories run the gamut from pretty weird to impossibly bizarre. Like, the guy last week who went to pee but changed his mind when he saw a man dressed as a cowboy handing out balloon animals. Or the next day when another customer stepped into the bathroom to see a man wearing nothing but a cowboy hat, boxers, and boots with spurs sitting at an old-fashioned stone sharpening wheel, literally grinding an axe. When he walked into the bathroom, the cowboy stopped what he was doing, looked up with a smile and a tip of the hat, and said, Come on, man. Come on with it. By the time he could find an employee to follow him back to the bathroom, the cowboy had vanished, bench grinder and all. The cowboy that may or may not haunt the gas station bathroom appears to follow a code of rules. He only appears when you're alone, he never hurts anyone, and he's always very polite. The prevalent opinion about him is that, honestly, he doesn't seem that bad, especially comparing him to some of the other things going on in that place. If you go inside, you might instantly get a toothache. It's a strangely common phenomenon that nobody really understands. It always goes away on its own after a couple hours. If you do go inside, you will almost definitely see me sitting behind the counter because I am the only full-time employee, and I am almost always here. You may catch me reading a book because, for some reason, the internet doesn't work way out here, and cell phone service is dicey on good days and non-existent on most. If you need to make a call, you can leave and go up the hill a ways, preferably back towards town because the other way will take you into the woods and you don't even want me to go into all the reasons why that is not a good idea. Or you can pay me 25 cents a minute and use the store's landline. That arrangement was cooked up by the owners and I have to actually enforce it because they do actually check the phone records. I'm sorry. While you're here, please don't be offended if I don't strike up conversation because if I'm being completely honest, I don't always know for sure if everyone that comes through those doors 
is real or not. And if I had to acknowledge everyone in that place that could potentially be a person, I would lose my mind. And we don't need any more of that going on around here. I guess the point I'm trying to make is this. Weird things happened to me working at this crappy gas station at the edge of town. I wish I could easily decide what was the weirdest thing to ever happen to me, but I can't. There were so many. I've seen a total of four coffins inside the store on three different occasions. I've met at least a dozen people wandering back into town from the woods claiming they had escaped aliens or government conspirators or the like and they had no money but they needed to make a call and could I please just let them use our phone before they find them again. But rules are rules and I'm not gonna lose my job just because you didn't escape captivity with a little pocket change. Then there was Farmer Brown, yeah that's his real name, who got mad at us and complained about the bulk feed we'd been ordering for him. He insisted that something was wrong with the product because all of his animals suddenly had human faces. We settled with him by charging a significant discount on his next couple purchases. He stopped coming in one day, and they found what was left of his body inside of a bedroom in his farmhouse that had been locked from the inside. As far as I know, they still haven't figured out what happened. Anyway, I guess I can tell you a story or two, but first I need to get ready for work. Part 2 at the edge of our town, there is a crappy little gas station that's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and sometimes longer. If you were to go inside, you would probably see the tired cashier sitting behind the front desk doing her best to mind her own business. She's real. You may also see someone else. You may also see something else. If you're curious about the reality of anyone or anything else, including yourself, inside of that small ammonia-scented, flickering fluorescent collection of off-brand junk food, dirt, and four walls, may I recommend that you follow the cashier's lead and just mind your own business. I've been working at that gas station almost non-stop since I graduated high school. At this point, I doubt I could quit if I wanted to. But enough about me. Let's get back to the interesting thing, the gas station. I spent a decent amount of time yesterday at the start of my shift trying to decide which story would be worthy of being my first to document to the world. Anytime I tell someone outside of the gas station anything about what happened within, I know what to expect. People don't believe it, or people don't want to believe it. I imagine the difficulty I had trying to call the sheriff to explain that half of a pig broke into the store and is currently running amok, breaking things and screaming with the voice of an old woman. Hello? Y yes, I meant half of a pig. Y yes, a pig. The front half. No, this isn't a joke, I am at the gas station. What do you mean, which gas station? The crappy one at the edge of town. You must be new, can I please talk to someone else? She finally put me through to Tom. Tom is the sheriff's deputy that drew the short straw all those years ago and had to come out to the gas station for the first time back before his hair was all white. He's been in enough times now that all I have to say when he picks up the line is, it's half a pig and it won't stop screaming and I can't catch it. And then he just grunts, mutters something about that being pretty freaking weird and then drives out to help me catch it. Tom is a good guy. I asked around, but nobody knew where the pig had come from. This was back when Farmer Brown was still alive, and he came down to take a look and provided his expert opinion. According to the farmer, the pig had somehow been chopped down the middle, but miraculously, none of the important organs were hit. Nothing supernatural about it, just really unusual. It stayed at the local elementary school as a kind of mascot for the summer before a scientist and his team from somewhere up north offered the school a thousand dollars to let them take it. For science, I suppose. Anyway, I don't mean to ramble, but my point is, it's hard to believe some of these stories if you haven't been inside the gas station at least once. And maybe you have. We're the only gas station for miles. 
we're close enough to some big crossroads. If you've ever been out driving in an unfamiliar part of the country and found yourself lost, it's not impossible that you could have found yourself at my doors. Maybe looking to top off your gas. Maybe to ask for directions. If you have a strange memory of a weird place that somehow doesn't seem to fit with the rest of your memories, then there's a chance we've actually already met. Now back to last night. I was sitting behind the counter with a pen and a book of receipt paper, trying to remember the strangest thing that has happened to me that still falls within the realm of believability. I've had plenty of things happen that were strange, but so unbelievable I wouldn't waste anyone's time ever trying to tell them. I call those the try and forget stories, when Diego interrupted my concentration. Diego is one of the part-timers at the gas station. We have a long list of part-time employees. The owners like to hire transients, drifters, hitchhikers, passers-by, and runaways looking for work for a few days. I try not to get to know the part-timers. They come and go after just a few days, and sometimes a few weeks, rarely long enough to form any kind of meaningful relationship. But then there's Diego. Diego has been working here for almost a year now. He started as a part of the prison work relief program, unloading trucks twice a week. He was the only one of 12 prisoners that didn't disappear during a freak snowstorm last December. But that's none of my business. Diego did his time, and when they released him, he came to work here, cleaning the store and unloading trucks. He comes in six times a day for each of his 30-minute shifts. Now that I think about it, I'm not exactly sure what he does during those shifts. The store is never clean, and the truck only comes twice a week, exclusively during the daylight hours as per arrangement following the incident. Maybe one day I'll ask Diego what he does for the owners. All I know is he's the closest thing to a friend I have here. When Diego approached me at the register last night, I knew something unusual was going on. He was sweating bullets, pale and on the verge of passing out. He kept glancing back at the man in the suit that had wandered into the store and was standing next to the frozen drink machine. He told me that he needed to talk. Now. I told him, go ahead, but he refused to say anything unless I followed him into the freezer. I usually hate to leave the front of the store unwatched. We have the occasional shoplifter. Plus, there was that one time Rocco got in and made off with two cases of cigarettes. But Diego seemed serious, so I made an exception for him. Once we were in the sub-freezing safety of the walk-in cooler, Diego asked me if I had seen the guy in the suit. I said yes, I saw him. He asked if I knew the guy. I said yes, I had seen the guy around town. His name was Kiefer, he was running for some kind of office, I can't remember which one, and stopped by the gas station every now and then. He drove an old black SUV that only took premium. I didn't know him much from in town, but he was definitely local. His picture was framed in my high school's trophy case for one of those sports competitions he had won years and years before I got there. We only have so many things to be proud of, I suppose. Sure, I knew of Kiefer, but we weren't exactly acquaintances. I told all of this to Diego, who just shook his head and said, No, that can't be Kiefer. I said, Well, why not? And Diego told me, That can't be Kiefer, because Kiefer is dead. I killed him two days ago, and his body is in the trunk of my car right now. And that is when things started getting weird. And I really don't want to have to do this. I recognize how awful it is to pause a story at a place like this, but I'm actually about to head back to work. I'm only just now taking my lunch break, and I came all the way down here to the library to document last night before I forgot. I still have to eat and change out of these dirt-covered clothes before I head back. I did a lot of digging last night. Plus, I don't want to leave the part-timers alone with all those lawn gnomes until we know exactly what's going on. Oh, I forgot to mention the lawn gnomes. I'm so scatterbrained right now. Like I said, it was a very strange night. Between the hand plants, Farmer Jr., and that cultist that wouldn't leave me alone, I hardly had any time to collect my thoughts. And of course, there's the Diego situation. I promise I'll come back and tell you all about it, but... First, I need to grab some coffee.
Thanks for watching, and before you go, here's a special shout out to my patrons who donated $20 or more. Painty, Zestros, Jocelyn Cunningham, Fantasy Rider Cosplay, Dark Nido Taki, Avrock Levgri, Jesse, Kibimaro Kaguya, and Simon Leverdeer Delisle. Thanks so much, you guys! If you're interested in becoming a patron and helping me to keep YouTube creepy, please feel free to check out the link in the card!